Hello everyone, my name is Yves Ganor. I lead the Lab of Neurogenomics and Precision Medicine or the NAPMED Lab at the Montreal Neurological Institute, McGill University. Uh, you can see Montreal uh, in the fall, which will be uh, very soon. And today I will talk to you about the genetics of multiple system atrophy. I will try to make this talk accessible to everyone at all levels, but there might be some terminology that might be difficult or things that I will say that might be unclear. In that case, I will also be available for you and your questions later on in the Q&A session. So this is a small disclosure slide where you can see uh, companies that I consult for and funding agencies that fund our research. And none of, the, none of them had anything to do with uh, the presentation I'm showing you today. So today we'll cover uh, three main topics. I will start with an introduction to talk about why do we even want to study the genetics of MSA specifically, but also generally the genetics of um, complex disorders. Then I will talk to you about what we know currently about MSA genetics. And lastly, what we need, what we still need to learn. Um, and what are the future perspectives in the disease? So let's start with the introduction. Why are we studying the genetics of MSA? Why is it important? So just to give you a little bit of background, I'm sure most of you know it, but just so that all of us are on the same page, I'm going to mention diseases that I will call them in the general name, synuclinopathies. Synuclinopathies is a group of diseases in which uh, there is an accumulation in different regions of the brain of a protein called alpha synuclein. Now the diseases, the main diseases that belong to this group, you can see them here on the left of the slide. Parkinson's disease, which I will call uh, PD. Dementia with Lewy bodies, which I will call DLB. Multiple system atrophy, the main topic of our talk, I will call it MSA. Uh, pure autonomic failure, I will not mention it almost at all, but I wanted to put it here because it's, it's, it's another form, although very rare, of synuclinopathy and REM sleep behavioral disorder or RBD, uh, which I will mention later on. RBD is slightly different than the rest in the sense that it's not an entity on its own. It's what we call a prodromal condition. People who have this sleep disorder, later on, they go on and develop Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies or multiple system atrophy in most cases. I will talk about RBD in the last part of the presentation. Okay, so why are we studying the genetics of MSA? There are many different reasons and I will only mention the main ones. Um, and I will talk about the population level, why are we studying MSA at the population level, but I will also talk on the personal individual level, how studying the genetics of MSA can eventually help at the individual level. So one thing that we can do and the main thing that us geneticists uh, uh, are doing usually when we study diseases on a population level, when we take a large group of patients and study their genetics, is to try to find genes that are involved in the, in the disease. There are many reasons why it's important that we find these genes. Some, uh, of course, they help us to, once we identify these genes, it helps us to understand the mechanism of the disease. And also, and maybe more importantly, they provide us with targets for future translational studies. Translational studies are studies that are helping us uh, to develop eventually drugs uh, from, um, from a specific target. Another thing that we can look at at the population level is what uh, we call genetic risk. Uh, when we analyze the genetics on a large group of, of individuals with multiple, multiple system atrophy, and we compare them to healthy individuals, we can identify potentially identify many different genetic variants or genetic factors that affect the risk of uh, developing MSA. And what we can do with all these variants, all these factors is to combine them into a single polygenic risk score. And I will talk a little bit about this polygenic risk score later on, but essentially it's a score that allows you to predict to a certain de degree, not fully predict, but predict to a certain degree who is more likely to develop a certain disease based on their genetics. 
Studying the genetic risk also allows us to identify uh, what we call modifiable risk factor using a method called Mendelian randomization. I know that there's a little, a lot of terminology, terminology here, but I will try to explain it um, later on. But in a very basic sense, what it means is that we can use genetic data to identify uh, factors that are not necessarily genetic. For example, uh, vitamin D level, B12 level, or other, other factors that are not genetic, but could be dependent on genetics. So we have this method called Mendelian randomization that helps us understanding how these risk factors uh, may be associated with risk for a certain disease. In this case, uh, we're interested in MSA. Another thing that uh, geneticists typically do is to look how genetics affect disease progression. As you know, some people progress very fast, some people progress uh, uh, much slower, and there are different types of, uh, of MSA and different subtypes of MSA that progress differently. And what we're trying to do is to, to see how genetics affect um, the, the risk to have the different types and how they progress. We can only do that on the population level. We cannot do that on the individual level, uh, but what we find we can later implement on the individual level, and I will explain it in the next slide. Another thing that can be studied using genetics is a response to treatment. Also, as you, you are probably well aware, some people respond better than others to different treatments, uh, mainly symptom, symptomological uh, treatments. And identifying the genetic factors that affect the different response for treatment can help us adjust or determine which individual will respond better to which treatment. And that will be especially important when we will have better treatments for MSA and similar diseases. And maybe the most important reason why we want to study the genetics of MSA is that it is mostly unknown, as you will see, in the second uh, part of this talk. So at the individual level, there are the, uh, different things that we will be able to do once we better understand the genetics of MSA. A term that I'm sure you all heard about, precision, precision medicine, basically means that we uh, give a treatment that is specific for a specific individual based on who they are, uh, based on their genetics, based on other factors in their lives, and try to match the best treatment to each individual. And that can be done also by using genetics. We can identify different mutations, uh, different genes that are specifically uh, important in specific individuals and tailor treatments based on that. And I will give you an example from Parkinson's disease. Uh, so PRS or polygenic risk score, which I mentioned before, it is also something that we can use um, for on the individual level, we can give this score that reflects the genetic risk of each, in, uh, each individual based on their genetic background, based on the different variants that they carry in their genome. So each individual have, has the score. And that score, as I said, can, can predict to a certain degree uh, how much they are at risk to develop a disease. In the future, and that's not something that is going to happen anytime soon, but, um, but it's definitely one of the directions that uh, people are aiming at, is to use uh, tissues from, the, from patients, test their genetics based on these genetic tests and other tests, try different medications on that tissue that was collected from the patient, and then later on, go back to the patient and um, and give them the drugs that work on the model based on their tissues. This, is, this maybe will be uh, the best form of precision medicine where we try the medication on the specific individual that uh, we created the model for. To give you an example uh, of, um, of how genetics contributed to the understanding of a disease and uh, and to potential treatment, I think the best example that we currently have in Parkinson's disease is GBA. So in 2004, this paper on GBA was published. Until then, it was not clear whether mutations in this gene are associated with Parkinson's disease or if they lead to Parkinson's disease. But this center, this, uh, this paper 
basically um, showed it very clearly that individuals with GB mutations have higher tendency to develop Parkinson's disease. In the last 15, in the last 17 years since, there's been many, many studies on the biology of GBA in Parkinson's disease, the mechanisms, and we still don't understand it fully, but currently as we speak, there are already several clinical trials that are specifically targeting individuals with Parkinson's disease who have GBA mutations. And the drugs that they are being given are drugs that specific, specifically target this gene. And we hope that the same thing will one day happen in MSA, but again, we are a lot more advanced in Parkinson's disease than we are in MSA, and we know a lot less about MSA. So let, let's talk a little bit about what we know in MSA genetics. So as I said, not much is known. We have to be honest. Uh, there has been studies and I will show you some of them, but overall, we don't have a clear picture uh, and it's actually far from being clear of how, the, how genetics affect uh, the risk of MSA and how it affects the progression of MSA. This is mainly because most of the studies that have been done so far uh, are based on relatively small sample sizes, which is a problem because it can create both false negative or false positive results. So false associations or false lack of associations. And because of that, we often get contradicting results. There are some papers or some studies that show that a certain gene might be involved in MSA and then a follow-up study um, cannot replicate the results of the original study. That doesn't necessarily mean that the original study is wrong. It could be that the second study is wrong, again, because of the small sample size, but it just leaves us in a place where we are not sure. So of course, what we really need and what we uh, are aiming for uh, in, the, in the world of, of geneticists studying MSA is to create much, much larger studies uh, that will allow us to overcome these, uh, these issues. So the first thing I want, the first gene I want, would like to talk about in the genetics of MSA is a gene that I already mentioned in Parkinson's disease, GBA. So GBA, the reason I'm starting with this gene is that this gene is already known to be involved uh, in all other synuclinopathies. So uh, Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, REMC behavior disorder. But what, what, what's happening with this gene in MSA? Let's see. So this is probably the largest uh, study that has been performed on uh, GBA mutations in Parkinson's, in, in MSA, sorry. And it included 969 MSA patients from different ethnicities that you can see are detailed here on the screen and over 1500 con healthy control um, population. And what the authors of this study found is that people with uh, GBA mutations have slightly higher risk with what we call an odds ratio of 2.4, which you can think of it as it means that people with this mutation has about a bit more than twofold risk to develop MSA compared to those who do not have mutations in this gene. The authors also show that GB mutations might be associated more with the cerebellar type of MSA. So this, this, is, uh, this is interesting, but when we compare this to what we see in Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, the effect size that we see here, the two, two and a half fold effect on risk is much smaller than what we see in in PD and in dementia with Lewy bodies. There have been other, uh, other studies that looked at GBA uh, and MSA, and a couple of them at least uh, found potential association with MSA as well, further supporting what, uh, what uh, the first study reported. But it's important to note that both these studies are quite small, um, so it's a little bit difficult to say conclusively, conclusively whether GBA mutations are indeed associated with MSA. What makes it even more difficult that there are other studies that could not identify an association between mutations in GBA and a risk of uh, multiple system atrophy. So in that sense, we are still on the fence. It's possible that GBA mutations are associated with MSA, but it's still not 100% uh, not clear as it is in other uh, in the other synuclinopathies. Next gene I would like to talk about is called 
synuclein. So this is the gene that encodes the alpha synuclein protein that accumulates in the different uh, synucleinopathies. And synuclein has been shown, uh, the synuclein gene mutations in this gene or and even common variants in this gene have been shown to be important in, in PD and DLB and also in RBD. So in different types of synucleinopathies. In addition to that, there have been a few studies that showed that some patients with specific mutations in the gene synuclein, and you can see here, these are the names of the mutations, and these are the, the authors of the studies. Uh, in, in specific families, in people who carry these mutations, they had the brain pathology was a combination of Parkinson's disease and MSA, where the, the accumulation of alpha synuclein occurs in different cell types. There, also, there were also studies that showed that common variants in the synuclein uh, gene or around it are also associated with uh, risk in MSA in a European population, but studies in other populations uh, failed to show it. And the more recent genome-wide association study, uh, which I will talk a little bit uh, in, in one of the next few slides, this genome-wide association study also did not identify an association of synuclein uh, variants with MSA. So here too, just like GBA, and to a certain degree less than GBA, we have some evidence that potentially link synuclein variants, genetic variants with MSA. But here too, uh, there are contradicting results from different studies, so we don't know uh, for a fact. The next gene I would like to talk about called COC2. Uh, it encodes this uh, enzyme that its name is, is mentioned here, coenzyme Q2 polypranyl transferase. And it's important in the, in the synthesis of Q10 that I'm sure you've heard about. Also for this gene, there have been some uh, inconsistent results. So uh, let's discuss them. The, the biggest study and the most important study that was done on COC2 uh, several years back suggested that in some families, uh, people who carry two mutations in this gene um, have, uh, have high risk to develop multiple system atrophy. Uh, they reported, the authors reported on a common variant in this gene, which is mentioned here, the V393A, but also other rare variants in this gene that are affecting the activity of this, this enzyme and are associated with uh, multiple system atrophy in the, in the families and in the patients that were studied in this, in this paper. So this paper was done in the Japanese population and in this, uh, the authors reported that this uh, variant, the V393A, is uh, unique to this uh, Japanese population. But since then we have learned that uh, this variant can be found in, in other population. Uh, these populations, this is taken from from a website called NOMAD, where you have multi, uh, genetic data on multiple populations. And you can see here, for example, in Latino population, uh, this specific variant is actually uh, more common than it is in East Asian population, where uh, the first study has been done. It also exists, but it's quite rare in other populations, South Asian, African, and European populations, but it's a lot more rare. Um, also for this gene, the genome-wide association study that I mentioned before, and I will talk about in one of the next slides, did not find association. So this is again weakens the, the link of this gene to MSA. There are some other East Asian populations that also did not find association with uh, this gene in Korean and, Ch and Chinese populations. However, there were also other studies that did find an association and meta-analysis of all these studies did show uh, an effect, a moderate effect of uh, this specific variant, the V393A variant on risk uh, for MSA. But there could be biases here. The main bias that, that typically happens when you do a meta-analysis, when you combine results from multiple studies, is that people tend to publish studies that are positive. When they find an association, they tend to publish it. And sometimes if they don't find an association, they don't publish it. So when you do a meta-analysis, you only analyze what was published and there could be a bias of uh, the positive papers that were published. So we need to keep this in mind. And here too, uh, 
the role of this gene as well is still unclear uh, in MSA. Other genes have, all, uh, have also been suggested to be involved in MSA. Uh, one of them is a gene called MAPT. Uh, this gene encodes a protein called tau, and this protein accumulates in different neurodegenerative diseases. Therefore, it's a very interesting gene to look at. And the, the, there's been a few, uh, a few studies that suggested that variant in this gene, we call this variant the H1 haplotype, um, is associated with risk of MSA. Um, and interestingly, uh, uh, the genome-wide association study did show some evidence, but it wasn't conclusive evidence that this gene also might be associated with MSA. So in this case, there's a bit more uh, uh, evidence, but it's still not enough to say that MAPT is a gene that is important in MSA. If you look at the literature, there's a bunch of other genes that have been reported uh, in MSA. Some of them are mentioned here. Some of them, it's uh, single mutations, very rare. Some of them, it's it's a repeat what we call repeat expansions, repetitive, uh, repetitive uh, sequence within the gene that is elongated, that is expanded. Uh, but none of these genes have uh, strong evidence for their association with MSA. So I put them here so we know that they exist and maybe in the future, some of them will be proven to be uh, real MSA uh, related genes. Uh, Genome-wide association study um, that I mentioned, it's a way to look at the entire genome of, of the individuals in the study and to analyze simultaneously millions of genetic variants. And when we do that, it allows us to uh, identify genomic regions that are involved in the, in the disease. So not necessarily a specific gene, but a genomic region. So to identify the gene, we need to do additional studies after we do a genome-wide association study. The thing is, the thing is that with GWAS, uh, to be effective, the sample size must be very large. And as you can see in this GWAS uh, that I'm showing you here, the sample size was quite large for a disease as rare as MSA, but it's not large when you consider that this is a genome-wide association study. So this study included a bit over 900 patients and more than 3,800 controls. And overall, they did, uh, the authors did not find any gene that was associated with MSA after correction for uh, multiple comparisons. They did report several genes that I mentioned three of them here, that are potential candidates because the statistical association was uh, stronger, but it still wasn't stronger enough to be more conclusive. There were several uh, follow-up studies that looked at these specific variants that were reported by the authors, and most of them did not find an association. However, like I mentioned before, most of the studies being done on MSA are small studies, so there could be false uh, negative studies, and what we really need are much larger uh, studies. One last thing that I want to mention about what we know about the genetics of MSA before we are going to the last part of the talk is this, uh, this paper showing that there could be shared genetic background for multiple system atrophy and inflammatory bowel disease. So this paper uh, found uh, three genes that are potentially involved in, um, in both inflammatory bowel disease and multiple system atrophy, but again, this study uh, must be replicated in uh, a larger cohort. So to conclude this talk, we will talk about what we need to do in order to learn more about the genetics of MSA, what we need to do in the future, and I will tell you a little bit what we are doing in my own lab. So these are the things that we still don't know about the genetics of MSA. We don't know how much genes uh, actually contribute to MSA in terms of what we call heritability. Um, if we look at uh, diseases like Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, we know that the heritability is relatively low. In Parkinson's disease, it's maybe around 30%, and in dementia with Lewy bodies, it's about 10 to 15%. So we, we assume that it will be similar in MSA, although we don't really have uh, good information about that. Uh, but we do want to know uh, how much genetics generally contribute to MSA. Um, so despite we don't know um, much about the genetics, 
of MSA, it's, it will be crucial to, to study because genetic studies are easier uh, to do than, for example, environmental studies, because if it's not genetic, it's either environmental exposure to something, whether you know, in the food that we eat, in the air that we breathe, viruses, pathogens, etc., or it could be stochastic events that we have no control of. Now, studying all these exposures and definitely stochastic events, these are things that are very difficult to do. But genetics is a lot more easier, and that's why I think at least we need to focus a lot more on studying the genetics of, of MSA, especially because, as I mentioned before, it can also provide some knowledge on modifiable factors that are not necessarily genetic. Uh, we, also, we obviously don't know which genes are involved in terms of risk and progression of MSA. I mentioned it throughout the entire talk. And we don't know which genes are associated with the different subtypes. One thing that uh, my team is doing is looking at individuals with REM sleep behavioral disorder as uh, prodromal or as an event that occurs before the onset of Parkinson's disease, dementia, with low bodies, or MSA. So here I'm going to show you a quick movie. Um, and this individual uh, has RBD, he's lying in his bed and he's currently dreaming. And he's dreaming that he's being attacked while walking in the park with his wife. And as you can see, soon he will start punching the bed because in his dream, he's punching the people who attack him. So this is RBD, REM sleep behavior disorder. You enact your dreams while during REM sleep. He is fully asleep. He is not aware that he's doing that and he will continue to sleep after. The interesting thing about RBD is that if you follow up these patients after a while, uh, in average 10 to 12 years, they develop either Parkinson's disease, dementia with low bodies, or multiple system atrophy. RBD uh, occurs in about 1% of the population. There are more males than females, and most of them will develop either Parkinson's disease, about 45 to 50%, or dementia with low bodies with similar percentage. And only a small minority of them will develop MSA. But following up on them and learning who will develop MSA and trying to understand why, could be uh, an excellent way to understand uh, the causes of MSA. So we are currently studying uh, uh, GBA, we are currently uh, studying RBD. Uh, one of the studies we've done that I want to show you is, is on GBA that I mentioned before. So as I mentioned, GBA is also associated with RBD. But what's interesting is that uh, GBA variants may also affect how fast RBD converts or progresses into Parkinson's disease, the metro bodies, or multiple system atrophy. However, we don't know if uh, there's any link for MSA because in that study, the number of MSA patients that we had at the time was quite low. A similar study that we did on another gene that I mentioned before, the Synuclein gene, also showed that variants in this gene are associated with the rate of progression. Uh, those that carry two variants progress much faster from RBD to PD, dementia, or MSA compared to those that carry one variant or compared to those who carry uh, no variants at all. But again, how this plays a role in MSA, it's still to be determined. And one of the things that we're doing in order to, to try to answer this question is uh, to create this RBD genomics consortium. Uh, what I'm showing you is the different uh, sites where we recruit individuals with RBD in this into this consortium. And these individuals are being followed up um, by the clinicians that recruit them. And we document when they develop uh, Parkinson's or MSA. And then we can study it more. So we are currently performing, it's still unpublished, the first genome-wide association study on RBD where we find uh, several genetic areas that are associated with RBD. Um, in this study, we had more than a thousand uh, patients with RBD from our codes, plus we had data from 23andMe, and we combined the data together to analyze and identify the genes. Again, here we did not study specifically MSA, but the plan is to expand this study to make it much, much larger so that we can uh, identify those that convert into MSA and study them specifically and try to identify which genes are involved in those that convert to MSA. So this, is, this will be my last slide, and I will talk a little bit about future directions. 
So as I mentioned, we are now doing a study in my lab on RBD, a genome-wide association study, but we are also doing a whole genome sequencing study, which is a different method where we sequence the entire genome. And one of the goals is again to identify those that develop MSA and to try to identify genes that are involved in that. On top of that, there are larger uh, MS, uh, studies on MSA, genetic studies on MSA. Um, there's the MSA Genome Sequencing Initiative that is currently doing a larger GWAS than, than, than the previous one. The current GWAS will include about 1,500 MSA patients, but they will also look at more rare variants because in genome-wide association study, you mainly look at common variants. And depending on the the, the final sample size that they have and the statistical power that they have, they might do additional follow-up uh, um, genetic studies to determine genetic associations with other diseases and to identify uh, modifiable risk factors for MSA. I want to mention that specifically in Canada, we have two initiatives that are originally for Parkinson's disease, but we also recruit individuals with MSA who are interested in contributing to, to research. These are the Quebec Parkinson's Network and the Canadian Open Parkinson's Network. Well, we also collect uh, DNA samples from uh, MSA patients, and the goal is to do whole genome sequencing on these patients, to study them, and to collaborate with the MSA Genome Sequencing Initiative that I just mentioned. And this is maybe the main message from this talk, that in order to solve, to understand the genetics of MSA, we must have uh, worldwide collaborations because, as you know, MSA is, is quite rare. It's really difficult to uh, find a large enough uh, amount of samples to, uh, to perform proper genetic study on your own. So it, there must be uh, international collaborations, and this is where we're heading. So with this, I would like to thank uh, many of the collaborators that we have. Uh, but first and foremost, my team, you can see here with their names the pictures, the collaborators from the International RBD Study Group, um, from the Canadian Open Parkinson's Network, the Quebec Parkinson's Network, 23andMe, the NIH, the International Parkinson's Disease uh, Genomics Consortium, all of these uh, contribute a lot to the studies that we are doing and they're, uh, together we are trying to do studies uh, to better understand ge the genetics of, of MSA. So thank you for listening and I will be available for questions. Thank you very much.